<laughs> All right. So let's um, bow in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father God, we come humbly before your throne of grace, Lord, thanking you and praising you for this day. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercies that you bestowed upon each of us and giving us another opportunity to come here in the house of the Lord. Uh, we ask that you will continue to bless each soul that's here today in the sanctuary, as well as those who are viewing um, across the country uh, through YouTube. And continue to bless the saints, Lord. Continue to uh, allow us to evangelize lost, Lord. And continue to just lift up to you all the wor world affairs, oh God. And so right now, Lord, I just ask that you speak through me, use me, anoint my lips of clay. It's in Christ Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> you know, over the last few years, you know, we've gone through a lot as a people, um, as, a, as a country, uh, just throughout the world. And I remember when we first started having Sunday school um, online, and one of my first um, lessons, uh, we talked about changing your mental models. Um, since then, you know, throughout this whole pandemic and throughout all the issues that we've gone through and endured, um, God has kind of placed on my heart to continuously self-evaluate myself. You know, you know, go through your life over the last couple of years and figure out what it is that, um, that he, he's changed. Your focus, your perspective on life, and there's a few things that God has, has shown me. One is the value of relationships. You know, that I have to put more emphasis on relationships. Cultivate relationships. Another area is companionship. Protect your home, protect your relationship, your companionship with your wife. He also said friendships, making sure that we protect and enjoy friendship. Be a good friend, uh, nurture those friendships. Um, just the things that personally I used to take for granted. You know, yes, I hung out with people. Yes, you know, I just had a mentality of, you know, it is what it is. You know, if they don't call me, I ain't gonna call them not knowing what's on the other side, what people go through. And so I started to just really dwell and just for myself, what can I do? God, why is this, you know, why is this? But then he took a little step further. Discipleship. We need to do more, you need to do more discipleship. So what I've done is I made myself more available to people, talk to them, listen to them, you know, uh, invest time in them, with them. And that's something that God, I think, as, as a people and as a church, over, you know, is that if we're here today, it's a blessing because so many people that we love isn't here. Uh, another thing that God has kind of, I have self-reflect, it really came to light yesterday. I was looking at this documentary, uh, with Charles Barkley interviewing Dr. J. And he asked Dr. J, do you ever think about your mortality? And Dr. J you know, said, yeah. And I said to Tammy, I said, you know what? Man, lately I've been thinking about my mortality. Because over the last two years, I've had maybe 10, 12 friends that passed away from COVID and other, other type of you know, ailments or whatnot, um, but just health issues. But it just seemed like death just really uh, has been elevated. You know, everyone that passed away, you know, just a, just another just another rent gushing gu uh, rent gushing um, event. So yes, you know, especially when you have people dying in their fifties, and I'm 54, and it's like, man, you know, yeah, I think about it, and I believe a lot of other people think about it too, but they're probably just not going to say it. So what I've done is I just wanted to just be more self-expressive to share my feelings. In 2 Timothy 2.1, the Apostle Paul wrote, uh, second, wrote to Timothy, and I want to just kind of highlight the relationship of Paul and Timothy. 
you know, Paul was, he was a different type of person. You know, when you look at both phases of his life, when you look at how he was before he was saved and how he was after he was saved, there's really no difference other than one without spirit, one with the spirit of God. He, you know, he still walked in boldness. He still, you know, invested in people. He still was impactful. And so when you look at Paul, Paul had a lot of relationships at different levels. You know, you took, see Paul and Barnabas, you see Paul and Silas, you know. Uh, and you could just, it's just a list of different people. Paul, well, missionary journey with John Mark. Paul was instrumental, but it's something about Paul and Timothy. And so in 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 3, it says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard amongst many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So you have Paul writing to Timothy. And, and what's interesting as it relates to, to, to Paul, um, to, to, to first and second Timothy, these were, were letters or these were, Paul inked these as, or they're earmarked as pastoral epistles. The reason why they're called pastoral epistles are because they were written specifically by Paul for, to a specific, for a specific purpose. He wrote to Timothy addressing a specific of how to, how to lead a church, because he was a young pastor. You know, church leadership, church discipline, Christian living, all of those things, all those elements are things that only pastors have to deal with. And that's what Paul was doing. He was saying, okay, I'm going to write these letters to Timothy. As you look at these epistles in First and Second Timothy, and then also Titus was the third pastoral epistle. And you go to the next slide. <clears throat> when, you do, when you look back on the life of Timothy, you will see that Paul took a special interest in Timothy from a young age. Who can tell me something about Timothy? Anyone can just, you know, what have you heard or what, or what have you um, heard about or is there any characteristics that you may, ha that you may know as it relates to Timothy? Here, here's the mic. Paul, Paul's uh, mother was, was Jewish and Paul's father was Greek. And so he, he had a, a, a mixed uh, background in terms of his religious faith. Another thing, the reason that uh, Paul was writing to him is that he was a young minister, but he was also, uh, he wanted him to be bold in his faith because sometimes he would be uh, kind of timid. And he would tell him, hey, go forth in, in the name of Jesus Christ in terms of delivering, you know, what you've been uh, trained to do. Okay. <clears throat> so in 2 Timothy 2, 2, 2 Timothy 1, 5 through 6, Paul said, I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now that it lives in you. So at an early age, at the age 16, Timothy accepted Christ, and his grandmother and his mother nurtured Timothy, and five years later, when Paul come around on his missionary, to start his second missionary journey, he take heed to Timothy, and he decided, I want Timothy to come and go with me. And so you will see that in this perspective, we're talking young in age. And as Brother Jerry said earlier, there are some, there are some, there are some, some perceived, what I like to say called perceived weaknesses that when you, when you read the life of Timothy, it talks about Timothy being timid, some say t that Timothy was, was, was kind of fearful. Well, he was young in the ministry. He was 21 years old. 
So yes, you know, Paul recognized that there is something about Timothy that attracted me. He's willing, he's available. But here's the beautiful thing, Timothy was humble. At 21, to be able to submit and go on a journey with Paul, that's special. And so I would say to each of you is that, start thinking about, is there anyone that you know that has the potential? And are, and are they willing to be a follower of Christ? Or they are already, they just need nurturing. Because again, at the end of the day, we've gone through, there, and it doesn't have to be about the age because we're all young in some state of Christ. We may be young in age, young in the faith, you know, young in ministry. So we have to understand that there's different levels that, and, and that regardless of how old you are, there's a potential if you're willing. In this case, Timothy was willing. And because of that, Paul obligated himself to the point where he had to equip Timothy. Once you have someone that's willing and ready and able, you have to equip them. He, Paul equipped Timothy for the ministerial staff. Again, at 21, he goes on a missionary journey. At 30, he becomes a pastor at Ephesus. Paul just up say, you know, you, you tarry here and you lead the church at 30. I would be timid. I would be scared. Any questions about Timothy and about Paul? I forget, I, I gotta make this interactive. <laughs> no questions? One thing about Paul and Timothy's relationship is that Paul put Timothy in situations where he had to push Timothy beyond his natural ability. One time he sent Timothy to Corinth because Corinth got mad at Paul because Paul teaching sound doctrine and Corinth was one of the churches that we all know that had a lot of issues to the point where Tim, uh, Paul got upset. But then later on, he sends Timothy to go deliver a letter and to, sta and, and to stand in the gap for him. Again, as a role model, you have to be willing to invest and be willing to sin and also be willing to pour equip that person in order for them to be able to, to succeed. I don't know about you guys, but other than, you know, other than, I, I guess I just keep, I just dwell on the last few years, it's pushed me to the limit. And unless we connect with someone, and there's people that's hurting, and we need to be a little bit more mindful, you know, to call someone to just get into a one-on-one -on -one conversation and see what's going on. That's something that, you know, on a humbug, you know, I made it a point once a quarter, you know, once a quarter, I send a text out to just about everybody in my phone, a lot of numbers, just saying, hello, how you doing? I hope all is well. And I get calls because people want to talk. These are things that my wife don't even know I do. You know, that's because people, some people feel, are feeling forgotten. Ma'am. Exactly. Because of the pandemic, a lot of people are at home. They're maybe working remotely. They're not in the office anymore. A lot of people aren't in church. There, may, there are some limitations. People are feeling isolated and if you just sit at home and you're not really filling yourself with the word, then you start watching television, you watch the media, you listen to all these negative things, and you start feeling despair, you know, you have feelings of despair, 
and hopelessness. And this is a time where we need to be active in encouraging people. Just a quick phone call. Or we have technology to do a text in, in, in a few moments. And this is, what, this is a way that we can reach out and be those hands and feet, and especially at this time. Right. Amen. You know, social media gives a false illusion that we're connected. And so people are on social media, we're all on social media, but when it comes to trying to get people out, especially now, you know, yeah, it was COVID, you, things are starting to open up, but you know, some people aren't even attempting to get going again. There's a lot of people, I think um, they say that, um, one, one I found was interesting, they say loneliness is, 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 is an epidemic that's on a rise that people, although, again, you think you're in the mix of what's going, you know, in the mix of, you know, companionship and all that, but loneliness is on a rise and that's leading, leading to anxiety, that's leading, uh, leading um, I think depression is up like 30, 35 percent versus pre-COVID. There's a lot of health and, and mental issues that's elevated today versus you know, pre-COVID. Some people, you know, and, and we all know that depression, those things sneak up on you. You know, you don't, even, you don't even know that you're depressed. You don't even know that I'm feeling some type of way and I don't even wanna make an attempt to even come back to the sanctuary. You know, some people have fallen to, the, some saints have fallen to the wayside and they don't even really know it. Our job, my, my office, our, uh, my organization, they just sent out a memo a few days ago saying that they would like, um, thanks, that they want to, that people are going to gonna have to start coming back into the office, um, I think starting in May, two days a week. And prior to that, they sent out a survey and 97% of the Organization said they didn't want to come back. <laughs> that they, you know, I'm at home, I'm, I'm, I'm doing well, I'm fine. But now CEO says, I say, well, we're going to go to this hybrid two days a week. Matter of fact, I'm going to even tell you what days I want you to come in. It's going to be Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And now you start to hear a lot of chatter. People don't want to go back. That means people are going, they're going to leave. They're going to look for other jobs, and we're probably going to start having an issue. So unless we, people are, you know, we have to get people back connected. And that's one good thing about Paul is Paul stayed connected to Timothy. First Timothy, he helped, he outlined everything that, that, that Timothy needed in order to be successful. And likewise, we're going to have to, we're going to have to be proactive in helping people get back in, in this game called real life. No more Zooms all the time and all the, you know, all the internet stuff, we have to get people back. And it was another interesting um, um, conversation that I heard when they said, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a generation of babies that was born that the only thing they know is masks and social distancing. And so there's gonna be a problem, they, they, and they believe it could be some, it, there may be some social skill problems, especially, you know, kids that's in early ed right now because you know, we taught them for two years how to social distance and physical distance from one another. And so, if that's a problem at the young age, I mean, us as older people also, there are some issues. So again, I'm just saying, we have to think about these things. Sister. Uh, Darren, I'm so happy that you're talking about this at this time because you're right in terms of social distancing and wearing masks. At uh, the school where I work, I work with young children, three to uh, five years old, some six. And what I find is they want hugs. And you better believe I'm giving them hugs. You know, some people are saying, well, you don't have any connection with them. You may get this, that, and the other. Those babies miss that and they need that physical touch. Mm -hmm. And so when they run up to me for a hug, I hug them back. 
because that is nurturing for them. And why would we cut that off from them when we know that that's a rejection if someone comes for a hug and you say, oh, no, 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 we can't do that, child. No, no, no. <laughs> so we do need, we need to get back to that. And when you were talking about jobs, um, I really didn't like working from home. I didn't. There are too many distractions, you know? Because when I'm at work, I like to cut everything off. When I am at home, I'm seeing stuff that needs to be done, and I'm going to do it. That's just the truth. So I was happy when we were able to go back to work because it felt like being at work. <clears throat> Anybody else want to share, you know, how, how, how are you adapting to, as, as things open up, you know, how well are you adapting or assimilating back somewhat into n normal society? Anybody want to share? Are you, is it easy to assimilate back or are you having difficulties or? You know, it's interesting that you're referring to uh, Timothy and Paul relationship. One of the things that I get from the relationship in terms of what we could do today is that Paul wants to move Timothy from preference to conviction. Because when you're convicted with something, when you have that conviction, you are compelled to do something with passion. And to answer your question, one of the things that I've started doing and, and, and what I do for a living is that I have the opportunity when, when, I'm, when I'm with people is when they're going through problems, the first thing I ask them, I said, do you know God? And it opens up a conversation for me to be able to explain to them that if you knew the God of the Bible and understood the things that was going on, you would have greater hope. So it, it allows them to ask me questions and allow me to be able to explain to them why I'm convicted and why I, I have hope during, in the midst of chaos, I have hope because I know the God of the Bible. So it gives me an opportunity to really share the gospel in fact, uh, last week I had an opportunity to share the gospel with someone, and the person was so attentive, and they said, you've never shared with me this before. I said, that's because the timing wasn't right, but because we've developed a relationship, it has given me an opportunity to now to talk to you, and I noticed that you were very attentive in what I was saying, because the person was, was really concerned about what was going on in the world and society. So she said, you have made me felt so good by sharing this with me. So to me, it's all about being convicted and conviction will compel you to be able to share what's on your heart and not be ashamed of it. Man. So, you know, and, and, that, and that's key, you know, the, one, one thing about the relationship with Paul and Timothy is that once Paul adopted Timothy, more so he said, this is my son, at that point he obligated himself. You know, and I, and I said earlier, you know, he obligated himself to the point where I have, to make, I have to make a commitment because now I need to help this kid become successful. And, and so, again, it, it, just in life, it's hard to obligate yourself, you know, and this is an area, again, where I'm, I have to work on to obligate myself to connect with someone so to the point where, you know, I'm all in to help them get to reach their goals, you know, outside of my own kids, you know, our own personal kids, you know, we'll try to move heaven and earth for our kids. And, but yet and still, at the end of the day, our kids are blessed too because they do have us. It's the, uh, it's, it's the other population of people that struggle that you know we have to make a concert a concert effort to reach back and to be able to obligate and pull them forward you know a christian role model a good role a good role model is a believer in jesus who is true who truly follows jesus seek him to grow in faith encourages others during difficult times 
and not being influenced by public opin opinion. You know, so we have to be selective, you know, as, 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 you know, as people seek out role models and you being a role model, just making sure because at the end of the day, you, you know, you're gonna be that a person example. And you know, and, and as and as a mentee, someone that's looking to be looking up to as a role model, sometimes you know, you may be the only Bible that that, that individual may be be you know that start off reading, and it can really affect a person. And so again, Paul, he was you know he was that role model. Uh, Timothy two two it says, and the things that thou hast heard of, of me amongst many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You know, Paul said, you know, you, you witness me speaking to the people. You, you witness my life. You see, you know, what, I, what I'm doing. And so now I want to do, you know, I want now the same uh, for you to commit so you can now then go out and you can teach other people also. You know, and so it's a domino effect, you know, it starts with us, we then pour into someone, and then that person then gonna go ahead and pour into someone. And that's what, you know, pastor for, for, you know, for this church has always been making disciples of Jesus Christ who will make disciples of Jesus Christ, you know. But, you know, again, that takes, you know, it's a big obligation to be able to take on that type of responsibility. Another characteristic of Paul, you know, was that, you know, the word mentor is defined as wise and trusted counselor or teacher. You know, Christian mentoring is somewhat different than secular mentoring. Christians are constantly striving to be like Christ, but do not attain perfection in this life. So as a mentor, you know, we're seeking out that mentor, that role model, that mentor, you know, you want to make sure that it's that, you know, and me and my wife, we had the discussion as we were talking about this, and you know, she was, at first I was just saying mentor, this, that, and the other, but she's like, no, it's, 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 a, it's a, you know, it's Christian mentoring. And so I, I started, I was more so, compartmentalizing mentoring. You know, if you like basketball, you find a person that has the same passion of basketball or whatever it is you find, and they mentor you, but at the end of the day, no. Christ is the base. They're the center, so if you're looking for a mentor, someone to, 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 to pour in your life, first and foremost, regardless of what it is, make sure they have a Christian base, because with that Christian base, everything else flows out. So you, you, because at the end of the day, basketball, yeah, I want a Christian counselor, a Christian mentor, because he's gonna help me be, practice not only basketball, but also practice self-control. Don't, don't argue with the referees. You know, don't use profanity on the court and hold you accountable. So making sure that that person has a Christian base is also important when selecting a mentor or, you know, or you as a role model. Um, looking to mentor someone, making sure that you have a life that shine. There's just a comment in the chat, and it's, a, it's kind of going back a little bit um, of what you were talking about, but uh, it reads, during this pandemic, I tried to impress upon my family and even friends and neighbors to focus on what things you can do with caution rather than the things you can't do. We must change with change. I'm so sorry, I, I can't, I can't, I can hear. If you can. I can, I can possibly repeat that. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was looking at the same comment. I was hoping that she would uh, actually make that comment. Can you hear me a little bit better? Yeah. Okay. During the pandemic, I tried to impress upon my family even friends and neighbors to focus on what things they can do with, ca with caution rather than the things you can't do. We must change with change. 
comment from the. It, it, what source is that? Comment from the internet. Okay. It, and that last part, you have to change. Right. And we and we talked about mental models. We have to change. You know the way the way. You know. Um, you know. <laughs> Just within our household, you know, um, we have our daughter living with us for a period of time and just being reconnected with the millennial mindset. And my daughter who's living out of state, you know, a millennial. So what I've done is I have to learn to listen. You know, I have to change some things, the way the perspective and outlook on life. And in the beginning, you know, I used to be very combative. No, you got to be this way. You got to be that way. You know, you, we have to live this way. You got to go to work. You have to be like this. So, you know, I had this whole just, just mindset. But what I've learned, again, through the pandemic is that we had to pivot. And everybody, we was forced into change. And really, that force into change changed my perspective and so now, you know, what I've done is you try to build off that. You know, we have to be better listeners as parents. We have to be better listeners to our kids. And I think for myself, I think back when my kids were younger, some of the dogmatic approaches that I had. And so have to, you kind of have to dial it back at some point and say, okay, you know, I got to listen before I react. Just one quick comment. As I, as I hear you talking about mentorship, what I hear is that uh, not only do you have to represent well, but there are others that help. Uh, thinking of Timothy again and his grandparents, you know, Eunice and uh, uh, Louise, is that who it was, I believe? And, and they played a part, which makes me think about us as individuals, as aunts, as uncles, as brothers, collectively mentoring our children, doing things differently. Right. You know, looking at them and seeing what their bent is and helping to mentor them by coaching them and things of that nature. I'm sure Timothy wasn't all that crazy about following in those footsteps considering that Paul was beat half to death and he said, come follow me. Right. <laughs> right. So, so sometimes it can be a little discouraging but looking at the bigger picture and sometimes that takes a um, for lack of better terms, a village. Right, exactly, yeah. You know, <clears throat> another important, another important uh, element of Paul was, you know, he was, a, he was an encourager. And that's something that we have to do a better job of is encouraging people. In 2 Timothy 2, 1, he says, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So he's telling Timothy to be strong, and he inked this uh, Second Timothy, you know, right before his death. And he was saying to Timothy, you know, I've given you the equip, you know, I've given you all the, I've equipped you, you know, I poured into you for over 15 years plus 20 years, and you're still relatively young. You're under 40, and and you're under 40 during this time, you know. You, they looked at you as, as being a child still. And he said, be strong. And so regardless of what, because he knew the problems and the struggles that Timothy was gonna have with, you know, you know how it is having a 35 year old, what if a 35 year old came to New Testament and became the pastor? <laughs> That's a whole set of problems that's created because now you have a kid, basically, that's trying to lead a flock. And, you know, and new ideas and just new way of doing things. That was gonna cause a problem and, 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 and Paul knew. So he said, be strong, you know, let no one despise your youth. Continue to press forward. And, and so, as, 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 so, Paul, even to his death, was still encouraging Timothy to do well. He says, endure hardness as a good soldier. You know, endure the pains, endure the struggles, you know, focus, you know, 
be respectful, make sure you follow God, the, your commands, the Bible is first. We have to make sure, you know, he, he, wanted, he wanted Timothy to understand, I need you. You know, it's almost like Paul was the hype man. He was hyping him up saying, you know, you got to do this. In Galatians 6, 9, says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Due season. He said, Timothy, be not weary in well-doing. You know, keep doing well. And I think that's what we have to tell people right now. You know, don't be weary. You know, we're almost out of this pandemic. You know, we're almost on the brink of you know, creating a new normal you know, you got to get back into the sanctuary. Come on and, you know, let's have a fellowship safely, right? Whatever we have to do, but you got to pull people and help them to do, not get weary, sister. Yes, um, I like what you just uh, mentioned about encouraging people to, especially the young people, to do and be who God called them to be. I think one of the things is us also as a church as encourages, as we encourage people or the young people to go ahead and do it, but to also be welcoming of the gift and the talents and what, you know, and the appointment, the anointing that God has on the young people so that we welcome them, we welcome them with their new ideas and ways of doing things. I think that is also encouraging. So I have two questions. Are you a Paul in someone's life? Or are you a Timothy? We have to be one or the other. And I think it lines, again, lines up with, again, the focus of the mission of the New Testament church. Either you're discipling someone, Paul, or you're being disciple, Timothy. But you have to be willing, and, and that's necessary in order for us to continue to grow in faith. And it was, it was so interesting is, is that even though I may be a Paul in this, in this relationship, I, I still got to have a Paul. I'm Timothy, so we really play dual, like dual agents. I'm, I'm a Paul in someone's life, but I'm also a Timothy in someone's life. And that's how the, the information continues to flow. Actually, you just said what I was going to say. You can be a Paul, and you can be a Timothy. Right. You just said that. So. Yeah. yeah. You can be a Paul, and, 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 and really, Lord, Lord forbid if you're neither. <laughs> you know, we, we have to be, you know, we, we, we have to be one or the other. We have to be in some position, because believe it or not, the more, the more you grow as Timothy, the more you're going to be able to be a Paul in someone else's life, you know. And, and so, and, 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 with, and with that, you get, when you're in that Timothy spot, you're getting the nurturing. You're getting the love. You get, you know, you're getting, you know, all the encouragement. But then what we do, we have to teach others also. Then I got to take that and I got to rent, you know, I got to, I got to invest in the life of someone else. So, you know, I just, you know, life is difficult not to have a Paul. And guess what? You're never too old to be Timothy. And so what I want to leave with you today is, you know, self-exam, you know, again, I try to self-examine myself. Sometimes I'm proactive in self-examining myself, meaning, Okay, I'm just going to lay in and let the conviction of God's word get in, inside of me and to show me where my shortcomings are and the areas in which I need to grow in. But then sometimes, you know, I mess up and the wife get on my case or my kids get on my case and now I'm convicted. Now I got to go and ask Lord, you know, help me understand. Well, you know, and those are the, those are the, the areas the times what you hate is when you, you know, hurt loved ones and you fail, you know, to be all you can be because you haven't spent that time with God to, for him to, to, you know, to mold your character and to help you be more hypersensitive 
to people around you. And so, in conclusion, every parent should remember that one day their child will follow their example instead of their advice. Every parent should remember that one day their child will follow their example instead of their device, their advice. And secondly, if the Holy Spirit lives within you, then you have something to pass on to another person. So are you a Paul or are you a Timothy? But at the end of the day, we're both. Any questions? I just wanted to, um, first of all, thank you for bringing this message on Paul and Timothy. And I just wanted to also share an example of Paul and Timothy right within this church, because when my husband Frank was saved, Oscar took him under his wings, and he walked with him. He taught him. Him and his wife discipled me and Frank. And at first I was thinking, why do I need to be discipled, you know? But when we went back over that, I learned so much. I think it's vital that we connect ourselves with someone who we may not even think they need what they need because we haven't connected with them. And I think it's a great idea for you to text all the people in your contact list and stuff like that. Because you're right, people are hurting. I do not believe that my husband would have been as victorious as he was had he not had an Oscar, a Paul in his life. Mm -hmm. And we complimented each other. Oscar, Frank talked to Oscar. So that time, Oscar was the Timothy, Frank was the Paul. You know, so we helped each other out. But you need somebody. Mm -hmm. You do, you need to have somebody that you can connect with when times, you know, when. Times are rough and times are good too. But especially now, we need to try to connect with someone within our body because we haven't seen a lot of people in a very long time. Yeah. But have we taken the time to check to see how things are going with them? Yeah. So I appreciate this message. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> and, and just to kind of add on, you know, as much as, as, much as Frank was 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 a Timothy to Oscar, he was a Paul to me, you know. Because <laughs> uh, you can never be in, in, in Frank's presence where he wasn't always teaching you and encouraging you and 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 pouring you know his knowledge and his wisdom and his experiences in you. So, you know, and 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 Oscar has been a Paul, you know, probably Paul to me and, and to many, you know. Um, and, and so, um, Brother Syfax or Paul, you know, so we have a lot of Pauls and, and, you know, but again, I know each of them are a Timothy as well, because you can't grow in life, you can't grow in the spirit to walk unless, you know, you sit in that dual seat. Um, I, you know, I talk to people, you know, daily, you know, I may be a Paul in people's life, but Lord knows I'm a Timothy, you know. We heard Brother James White a few weeks ago. He, he's a Paul in my life, you know. Um, and, and I'm constantly, you know, listening. And on Sundays, I think I, I listen to messages from 8 to 12. Because I ask, you know, it just different speakers that I've grown attached to over the last two years that I'm listening and seeking that knowledge. And, and it's made a world of difference for me. So anybody else want to share um, any personal experience of being a Paul or a Timothy or Brother Wilson? You know, a lot, a lot of times we hear about our, our Pauls and Timothys here in America, but there's a brother here this morning that I was wondering if he would just say a few words about how do we uh, minister to those Pauls and Timothys on the mission field, Brother Brother Yearwood. Yes. 
Yeah, we're going to put you on the spot. Hey, put him on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> yeah, I think um, it is so, so, in, so important, and I agree with what the brother says, is that everywhere we are, we are Paul's and Timothy. You know, and for, for us going into a, a different culture, different language, people do stuff so much differently than what we do in our own country. The, the presumption was that we were going over there to teach people because we have been to Bible school, we have been trained, and we are going with, with information to, to share with people, to teach people. And so sometimes going with that attitude of being a teacher first coming in from the area of being superior to teach, we had to be humbled first and take on the role of the intimities and even being a, a timidity to, to people who want to even be in say, who are not even believers at that time. And so being able to be, to have others speak into our lives within this new culture to, to help us to be better equipped to be Paul's later on, to be able to be teachers. So, so going in with the attitude very first of not being a teacher, but going in first as a learner into these, the, uh, um, these cultures, and now seeing believers coming up that we have to disciple and counsel in marriage, where culturally their marriage relationships are so, so, so different. The, the, the issues that they're dealing with are so different from, from us. But because we were Timothy's first, you know, it helps us to be better able to speak into the lives of these people who are coming to know the Lord. So, yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah. First of all, I just want to say thanks for the message. I, I think in order to be Paul and Timothy, uh, you have to be very humble, and you have to keep, as the scripture says in James, be swift to listen, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. And so in order to be that, you have to be able to listen, um, swift to listen. And a lot of times we want to talk everything, but I've got some Timothys in this room, one holding the mic. I mean, some uh, Paul's in this room. One of them's holding the mic. One of them sells cars. And another one preached a message this morning. And, and so, you know, whatever, whatever position you're in, just do it to the glory of God. Yeah. Amen. You know, what's, what's interesting, you know, as it relates to Timothy is that at, at the age 21, he was humble to be willing to travel on a missionary journey with, with Paul. And so, you know, again, when you, when you look at, and it, I told my wife, if I ever have a chance to say, say this, I'm gonna say it. That's why I don't like, you know, when people say the characters in the Bible. They're not characters, they're people. People in the Bible. So when you put it in perspective, people, that Timothy was 21 years old. Think about, your, if you have a t kids, think about your 21-year-old, and Brother Yearwood comes and he says, you know, I see something, you come on, and let's go on, I want you to come and go on this missionary journey with me. And, and so, you know, there's some, hum that person, he's humble. You know, first of all, he, he has to have a deep passion for God and be willing to sacrifice under God to be a, put himself in that position and to go on a journey for nine years and then in the midst of that say okay you're going to pastor this church I mean we t again we're talking 21 year old but since the age 16 I accept Christ and I'm being taught to 21 then to go on a missionary journey and then be a pastor at 30. I mean, when you put it in perspective and understand this is not a character, this is a person, man, at 21, I couldn't have done it. And, and so that's what made Timothy, you know, to me, an exceptional person in the Bible. Sister. First of all, I have two comments in the chat. Excellent lesson today, Minister Luckett. Thank you. I thought I would read that. And then the other comment, can you hear me? Because I know there's an echo. 
Can you hear me? I got a bad echo. It's echo. Both it's, of the it's mics are echoing. Sorry. Yeah. So I'm going to read this um, maybe a little bit without the mic, but it, it reads, what concerns me in today's churches today is why are there more active calls than Timothy? Calls should be reaching out, and Timothy, Timothy should be placing themselves under the call. We must examine ourselves. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, I mean, th that's real life, you know, and I think sometimes, you know, and this is, again, this is my, this is my own personal hang up. When, when I hear people say the characters in the Bible, it dehumanizes them as characters of, of uh, you know, of a, like this, they're not real. No, there are people and these are real live people that's done extraordinary things in, in, in the grace of God. And so when you, you know, when you put in perspective that it's a 21 year old that's on a journey, that's pastoring and away from his parents and just the whole, the whole gamut, it's like, wow, you know, uh, Paul, you know, I hear people say that the character of Paul, well, you know, Paul, it was real. Paul used to salute and kill Christians, and God stopped them and turned them around, and he became an apostle for Christ. You know, I think we all know some, I know a couple of Saul's that got converted into Paul. And, you know, and, and it's real because when you have a person that you know that was notorious get saved, but the Bible says that Paul went to Arabia and for three years he's there and the Christians were scared to disciple him because they, they still looked at him as Saul. Well, we know some people that say I'm saved and you kind of look at them side eye and don't really want to deal with them, you know. But over time, it's about being an example. And, and then slowly, it's like, man, this person is it's the real deal. And, and so that's the human part of the scripture that we have to guard brother. We have one more. Hey, thanks, Darren, for the lesson. I just want to read um, a scripture that I think uh, really touches on what you're talking about well. Um, just all the aspects of what you're talking about. It's Galatians chapter 6, um, verses 1 through 5. It says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in, a, in another, for each one should bear his own load. So I, I think the important part, um, you know, to the comment in the chat as, as to, you know, why it is, um, you know, we're not seeing a lot more of the Paul and Timothy dynamic is we're, we're, we're forgetting what the purpose of church is. It's not just to come and sit and learn. It's to build community. And it's to be in one another's lives and to serve one another. Um, we're saved for good works, right? Um, and if we don't embrace uh, what it takes to fulfill the law of Christ, bearing one another's burdens, and then we'll miss the mark. Um, and that's difficult, right? To be, you, you've been saying it, to humble yourself, to submit um, to God's call, to walk with someone through their difficulties when you find them in trespass um, and, and still be called to love them and to, to build them up in the midst of their sin. Um, and also be careful, being mindful of your own sin and your own propensity to fall short and still, you know, go forward in that calling. It's a challenge. It's really difficult. And yet that's our calling. Man. And so I appreciate you encouraging us today um, to, to walk in that calling. Man, praise God.
things. Okay. All right. Any other questions before I close in prayer? <clears throat> All right. Let us bow. <clears throat> Father God, we once again come boldly before your throne of grace, Lord, by humble in spirit. Father, we just ask right now that your spirit would rest upon us, O oh God, that you will allow the words mm -hmm. that was taken in to um, just to meditate and to, um, to catch root in each of our hearts, Lord, that we may be a, a better disciple, a better um, mentor, uh, that we become a better, um, a better Paul in someone's life, but yet and still be humble enough to be, have a spirit of Timothy as well. Lord, we know that um, there's many um, that, that's out in the world um, that need us, Lord, and we ask that you would just give us a revived spirit um, to, to be more proactive in, um, in, in doing your work and your ministry. So right now, Lord, I just ask that you bless each, um, each individual, Lord, that's partaking in this sanctuary, uh, your word in the sanctuary and, and the viewers at home, that you will continue to dwell in their hearts richly and that you will continue to allow them to be all that you call them to be. So right now, Lord, we thank you and we praise you. It's in Christ Jesus' name. May every heart say amen. amen.